explain to you and to inform you about something that every American should know. Now, because you're involved in the Tea Party, and because you cared enough to come out on a Friday night, I take the presumption of putting you in a class of people that is more informed than the average Joe, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So coming out of the gate, I expect you people know a little bit more about government, the rights that were supposed to be afforded and protected, and those that are not. And I'm here to tell you uh, that you don't have to be unhappy with the direction that our country is going, because I know you've heard it before from politicians. I'm not talking to you as a politician. I'm talking to you as a scholar. And I'll give you my curriculum vitae later. But I'm telling you, there is an answer, and it already exists, and it's so simple that in the next 45 minutes, when you hear what I have to say, it's going to be like, how come no one, ever, no one else ever thought of this? And of course, that's the same response I get from people, including some of the greatest scholars in the country, when I discuss this with them. And they're like, you've got to get your book out. You've got to get your book out, because people don't believe this. So I've come tonight not to lecture you with some cerebral, boring, you know, diatribe about the history of the Constitution in Article I. I'm going to make it interesting and fun because I'm going to show you in real time the books through history that have made mistakes, that have edited the rights that you were guaranteed by the result of a revolution, by the result of people meeting at the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, restructuring the government, and what we have today, to paraphrase, so it's amazing that Americans take for granted that the government we have today is in fact the government that the forefathers intended, and it's not. And I'm not just talking about the, 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 the gridlock in Washington and the fact that you know it's a yes, no, you know, it, it's become like a playground. But if I were to ask you how many members there are in the United States Senate, because you're supporting Steve Lonigan. You would obviously tell me, well, there's 50 states. The Constitution says no matter what your population is, each state gets two. 50 times two is 100. That is not that complicated a concept to grasp. If I were to ask you how many voting members there are in the United States House of Representatives, it's not a test. But if you knew, the answer is 435. Then the next question becomes, and why is that? And the response from 99% of the people is, because uh, it is, that's, that's how it is. Now, let me tell you a story before I get into the details. A young girl gets married. She wants to cook for her husband. Something maybe old-fashioned today, but... So she wants to cook a roast. So she doesn't know how to cook. So she calls her mother, and she says, Mom, how do I cook a roast? So she goes, all right, first thing you do is you cut the end off. And then you put it in the pot, and she goes, okay, but wait a second. What do you mean you cut the end off? You cut the end off and you cook it for the dog. Why? So, I don't know. That's how my mother always cooked, and so, you know, that's how I cook a roast. She goes, well, did you ever ask Grandma why she does that? She says, no. So she calls up her grandmother. And she goes, Grandma, you know when you cook a roast, yeah? You always cut the end off and cook it for the dog, right? She says, yeah. Why do you do that? Is it, like, spoiled? Is it bad? People can't eat it. What is it? She says, no, I never had a big enough pot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I say this tongue-in-cheek. The reason why we have 435 representatives instead of something a lot different is because people were not paying attention. And it is a variation on the I never had a big enough pot story. What people don't realize is the biggest dispute and the biggest, most contentious debates and fights at the Philadelphia Convention right across the river back in 1787 in that hot summer when they were fighting over this new form of central government, wasn't about what we call the First Amendment today, speech and religion. It was not about that. It was about representation in the House of Representatives specifically, the People's House. Because again, we forget your history. Everyone realizes that when we elect a president, uh, you people know more than the other, you don't really directly vote for a president. You vote for electors that vote for the president in the process that's come to be known essentially as the Electoral College. So the chief executive under the original Constitution, as originally configured, uh, was not chosen directly by the people. In the Constitution as originally configured, yes, each state got two members of the US Senate. But the senators were not chosen by the people. That didn't occur until 1913 with the passage of the 70th Amendment. Originally, 
the senators were chosen, elected, selected, semantics, however you want to say it, by the state legislature. And they could recall you, you know, you had a six year term, but you were essentially appointed. So if one party controlled the legislature, and again, there weren't parties when this government started, they would appoint their guy. And don't kid yourself, it was only guys, because as the women in the room know, you didn't even have the right to vote until last century. So it, this was a, a government that was formed by rich white men, many of which were slave owners, uh, that were trying to keep the southern states with the northern states. And in fact, in the negotiations, we had the chief executive being selected or elected in the Electoral College. We had members of the Senate being selected by the legislature. So the only place where the people that had just fought a revolution, blood had been spilled, lives had been risked, many lives had been lost. And I'm not being dramatic. You live in the, you know, New Jersey is essentially the crossroads of the revolution. People in Oregon do not have the same appreciation for revolutionary history as we do because we live, we grow, we grew up here. You know, how many, how many places are there in New, Jersey, in New Jersey? Washington slept here. There's none in Oregon. I'm not criticizing Oregon. I'm trying to put it back. You know, you know. So, so back to the House of Representatives. One of the primary issues that they were arguing over is the issue of slavery. Now, what we also forget, and again, I'm bringing this out because part of the reason why no one discovered this, and I blame myself for the same thing, it's kind of like, and this is going to be an extreme example. It's kind of like having an uncle that went to jail for being a child molester. We don't like to talk about and think about our past history as a slave-allowing country. Because by our standards today, it's inconceivable that that was not only allowed to occur, but it, it took a civil war to end it. And even then, even then, it took another hundred years and amendments to the Constitution, doing away with the poll tax, things like that, before there were equal freedoms. And I'm not even so sure today, in some parts of the country, it still has been attained. But my point is, slavery has its dirty fingerprints all over this story, and I'm going to tell you why. As you may know, and if you don't know, I'll tell you, or if you knew and forgot, I'm going to remind you. Under the original form of the Constitution, when determining members of the House of, membership of the House of Representatives, it was agreed that there would be a ratio of no less than one per 30,000. So the 30,000 was, was a floor. So you couldn't have one per 29,000. So it was a pretty big ratio. That's number one. Number two, it would be based upon the population. But the population is calculated in a census as only politicians. And, and again, I have great reverence because unlike people that throw out the, oh, the founding fathers, I know their names, I know their beliefs, I know their foibles. I love Thomas Jefferson. I'm a huge fan. He was a genius. He was also an adulterer who had an affair with, you know, when he was in France with a married woman and came back here. And, and if, if DNA is to be believed, may or may not have had, you know, children with one of his slaves. He was a great man, but as all men, he was flawed and had flaws. But we venerate these people in a context in history because it makes us feel good, which is okay when you're talking about social history, but not when you're talking about legal history because facts matter. You know, I had a friend, one of my best friends in law school passed away. He had a great line. He says, 95% of life is just showing up. I said, yes, Ed, but 5%, that's where the difference is. And if you're 95% right, even if you show up, that still means you're 5% wrong. Now, the problem is, if the 5% you're wrong on is on something significant, then there's a problem. Back to representation. During that summer, they fought hard, and they came to this compromise because the southern states wanted to count slavery, and the northern states said, well, you'll, you'll get too many representatives if we do that. And the northern state economy was largely based upon manufacturing or production, and, and the southern economy was largely agrarian. And so the deal was struck that for census purposes, people, even you know, children, women who couldn't vote, uh, or participate in the political process, would be counted, but, they didn't even use the word slave, you know, but others, indentured slave servitude, would be counted as three-fifths of a person. Now, can you imagine that negotiation? Three-fifths, now, what about seven-tenths? No, 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 I think that's too much. That's what they arrived at. And when we make laws, we always draw arbitrary distinctions. 
You're 18 years old, you're an adult. You're 17, you're not. You're 21, you can drink. You're 19, you can't. I don't know. That's what we do with laws. And that's what they did with that. And that remained intact and in place until the so-called 13th Amendment. There's a reason why I say the so-called 13th Amendment, and I'll get to that in a moment. Back to representation. So, 